Okay, folks, let's start. So, do you hear me? I hear you well, and myself well. Um, hello, everyone. Добрый uh, вечер. My name is Maxim, Maxim Salnikov, and uh, today we have uh, 30 minutes to go shortly through key concepts of Angular 2 and also, we'll try to get started with it, and we'll see some code. It's really challenging for me to present here, the same conference, same day, and even the same room, after Mishko Hevery was here. Uh, uh, as you know, he's Papa Mishko, uh, in the meaning of his father of Angular, and Angular 2. Uh, so, by the way, who was at his talk here? Nice. And maybe Mishko himself here? Good. Yes. So, actually, we had a short discussion with uh, him for not to intersect uh, in terms of uh, slides and uh, concepts. So, hopefully, I'll bring um, a bit uh, different information about Angular 2. Uh, Shortly about me, I work in a company called uh, ForgeRock. We develop digital identity platform, and I work in a special CTO team. Uh, we develop future concepts for our products. That's why I uh, love and I have to use and try all the latest frameworks, paradigms, uh, libraries, whatever, because it's kind of not for today, it's for Future And uh, as you understand, Angular 2 works pretty perfect in, in that sense for me. Um, also, I run um, local Angular meetups in uh, Norway, in Oslo. Uh, I'm Google developer expert in Angular, was approved last year. Last but not least, this November I organize a conference for mobile developers in uh, Norway, Oslo. It's called Mobile Era Rocks. It's easy to remember the Website address and CFP is open, so you know what to do. Uh, I have a Twitter, WebmaxRU. I tweet mostly about uh, Angular, uh, about uh, community things, about web development in common, about progressive web applications, so please follow me. Okay, enough about me. First, I want to give an idea why Angular 2 appeared at all and why it's not evolution of Angular 1, but uh, I can say revolution. Uh, let's check the current state of uh, web front-end. And uh, back, to, back to 2009, when Angular version 1 appeared, the web was different from what we have now. And uh, requirements for today's web applications are much more higher. And uh, we have to use corresponding tools to achieve the success. So, what we have today in comparison to 2009? First, we have uh, ECMAScript 2015, or just ES6, I'll call it uh, ES6 later. Uh, and this is actually first uh, serious update uh, to JavaScript since uh, 2009. And um, we are happy that this, it was finally standardized last summer, and now we can use, uh, okay, okay, almost can use all the super features of uh, ES 2015. Uh, what we will use and will discuss today, two main features of uh, this new language uh, classes and modules. What are classes? This is just actually syntax sugar over the um, prototype-based uh, JavaScript uh, objects. And uh, I'm sorry, where is my cursor? Imports allow us to decompose our front-end web application parts and load them only when we really need it. And now, fortunately, we can use these uh, features without any polyfills. Okay, with some limitations, of course. 
Next, web components were introduced in 2011 and consist of two or four main parts, which is uh, from which Shadow DOM is the most important and kind of core one. Uh, Shadow DOM it allows us to encapsulate uh, some piece of code, some component. That's why it's called web component, and not. Uh, to worry about uh, this component will affect the view of the rest of application. Uh, last but not least, reactive extensions. So we all remember how web uh, developed. So first there were some static pages, then some DHTML animations uh, and uh, JavaScript uh, used for kind of snowflakes uh, during Christmas. Uh, then there were there was uh, Ajax revolution, and uh, so we see that complexity of web grows, and uh, today's web is r something really asynchronous, and uh, it's hard to use all the paradigms for working with it. That's why um, reactive extensions and reactive paradigm moved to web. It's a well-known concept for backend languages, and uh, now we can use all the power of it on the web. So, what we have? We have new standards on, on the one hand, and we have Angular on the another hand. And uh, to follow all these standards, it was impossible to just implement slight changes uh, for Angular 1. That's why Angular team decided to rewrite everything from scratch, and uh, they came up with uh, Angular version 2. But anyway, we have to say some warm words about Angular 1. It's uh, definitely next generation framework for its time, for 2009. It um, introduced really nice uh, architectural patterns, uh, again, from the world of uh, backend to frontend. It's still super popular, 50,000 stars at GitHub at the moment, and it's still under active development. And uh, it's really interesting how it's developed at the moment. They uh, adopt new features from Angular 2, and the uh, most uh, interesting example is uh, component. So, Yes, it's an amazing product with vibrant community and uh, thousands of uh, third-party modules built on top of Angular 1. So you, have, you can find uh, libraries for everything using Angular 1. Returning to our standards. So Angular 2 just takes current standards and uses it instead of uh, inventing own ones. So in Angular 1, we had transclusion. transclusion. We have Shadow DOM. Uh, we have our own modules in Angular 1. Why use it? We, uh, since we have so nice uh, modules from ES6. And all these uh, entities, all these uh, things from Angular 1, like uh, mentioned on the slide, we could easily map to web components we have. That's why it's really nice idea to just take the standards and follow it and uh, build the framework on top of uh, standards. Second uh, important thing is performance. I will not uh, go in details because uh, I bet Mishko mentioned all these things in details. I've seen his slides. Uh, and yes, it's uh, up to five times faster than uh, version one, because it has really ultra-fast change detection. This is point number one. Also, again, using this modern standards, you can uh, run the Angular and uh, almost uh, all your application as a web worker in just parallel, in separate thread in the browser. So your UI will be always responsive and smooth. 
thanks to support of community, we have Angular Universal, so we can render our application. So we can run our application right on server side in Node.js, as an example, and uh, now we can run it uh, at .NET, and uh, there are some other platforms are on the way. Uh, views. Uh, uh, offline uh, compilation, it's something incredible that uh, soon, really soon, will be available. So it's uh, under development at the moment, uh, but it shows amazing results. So we don't need to render our templates in, in browser. Instead of this, browser receives super nicely optimized JavaScript. Angular 2 gives us really nice possibilities uh, to use the language we love. First, this is Dart. I, I'm not Dart professional, but I know that uh, it implements best sides of uh, backend uh, languages, so it, it, it tries to move the best things from backend side, from Java in particular, to front end, so you can uh, use Dart for writing your Angular 2 applications. Of course, JavaScript, and uh, formally you can uh, create Angular 2 applications in uh, today's JavaScript, or maybe it's already yesterday's JavaScript, which is uh, ECMAScript 5. Mm, but uh, I don't recommend you to, to do it, because um, you will lose all the laconic syntax. Uh, JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript 6 works much better in this way, and um, thanks to its class imports I've mentioned already. But if we go for ES6, I'd recommend you to do a step forward and use TypeScript. It gives us perfect tooling support, it gives us possibility to catch errors uh, even before our application was started, and uh, it works really well for large enterprise level applications when, when, where you have to f check the types. and. Uh, Cross-platform. Angular 2 is more than just framework. It's platform, and uh, you can run it on the web, of course. You can create hybrid mobile applications, and uh, Angular 2 plays super nice uh, with Ionic 2, and actually Ionic team and uh, Ionic product is uh, the main partner of uh, Angular 2 and one of first partners at all, so hybrid mobile applications, absolutely no problem. Thanks to render engine completely separated from uh, other stuff in Angular, we, can, we are not binded to document object model anymore, so we can render our views in for whatever we want, so no HTML, we just want to use. Uh, we just want to render our application to native mobile script like iOS or Android. No problems. We can use a library from Telerik called Native Script. Angular Universal. I already mentioned that we can run Angular applications on server side, and it gives us really nice benefits like. Uh, immediate start of our application without waiting for while browser compiles everything. Electron you, uh, moves your experience to uh, moves your web experience to desktop applications and even React Native. Uh, there are some uh, experiments with it. Yes, so this is our agenda for the rest of talk. We'll go through shortly through components mentioned dependency injection, syntax, data flow forms, and uh, I, th I think we will not touch routing. Not enough time. Yes, so what is component? Uh, it's main building block of the Angular, and it's, uh, you can say, it's quantum of Angular, and this is uh, 
self, something self-standing and it's self-describing in terms of uh, component, knows uh, how to cooperate with its host component, knows how to render it, knows uh, its own dependencies, and it has uh, APIs for input and output. So it's really reusable piece of your application. Uh, in version one terms, it's uh, just a controller binded to, to the view. Let's finally have a look at the code, how it looks. First, we import component class from uh, Angular framework. This export class is a uh, regular ECMAScript 6 class, so nothing uh, connected to with Angular here. And what makes this ECMAScript 6 class Angular component? This thing, component decorator, or notation in different sources. Uh, it works like a trigger for Angular engine, saying take this class and convert it to what we call component in Angular. And uh, there are many options, uh, like properties for this component, and it actually it's just metadata for our class. So selector is uh, selector for our host component, and template, I used a nice backtick uh, ES6 syntax here, so we can create multi-line templates. Uh, of course, it's uh, just for, for demo. Uh, we can, uh, for our real applications, we'll mostly use uh, separate templates uh, called through template URL uh, property. Yes, but it's really boring to just have completely unbinded from our, our application component. So let's uh, fill it with some data. How to do it? Of course, use dependency injection. It's a really well-known paradigm, again, from the world of um, backend. And fortunately, now we can use it on the web. I will not focus on what it is, because I bet you all know how to use it in Angular. First, we import uh, the class from our module. Next, we specify it as a provider in our component decorator. And last, we just inject it uh, to our class constructor. That's it. And as a result, our component, um, thanks to dependency injection, it uh, knows what to do with this uh, what I call places service. It's uh, how to instantiate it and uh, all the dependencies of uh, this places service itself. Template syntax. It's kind of one of most disputable thing in Angular 2, and it was not uh, perceived so well by developers community, at least initially. Uh, yeah, you see, it looks a bit... Uh, complex, it uses uh, all types of uh, brackets, so curly braces, square brackets, parentheses, it uses asterisk, it uses hash symbol. What is what? Double curly braces, our well-known uh, from Angular 1 interpolation, so we can write expressions inside of it. Square brackets. If we see square brackets, we always know that this is property binding. Uh, this is something uh, about how data flows into our component. Hash something. Sometimes we need to refer to some part of our component in the template, and we can easily use it uh, using this hash prefix. It works actually like uh, ID in HTML, but of course, uh, thanks to um, Shadow DOM and uh, component idea, 
we are not worrying about uh, duplicate names for these things in, in different components, for example. It's all managed for us by Angular 2. So in this example, you see that um, we call this city name input uh, for just giving a different color to it. Um, event binding. When we see parentheses, we always know it's something connected to events. And uh, events could be built-in events, like, uh, like click, like uh, submit. And of course, it could be our custom events. Uh, asterisks, it, they start uh, built-in directives. So ngif, good example. Nothing to mention here anymore. And um, two-way binding. Uh, it's kind of turned off by default in Angular 2 uh, because um, it was may maybe the weakest part of uh, Angular 1 in, in, in terms of uh, it uh, always uh, causes wow effect for the first time, but uh, while your application grows, it can affect uh, performance. But you can still use it, and uh, it has really complex syntax, but this is uh, syntax sugar, this is shortening for full mm, and more wordy uh, definition. And it's easy to remember, uh, kind of mnemonic sync. Looking at this, we always uh, remind ourselves banana in the box. So banana in the box. You can ask, is that really valid HTML? Yes, it's valid because uh, According to the strict definition, we are free to use these uh, parentheses as a part of names of uh, HTML attributes. And if you wish, you can always fall back to canonical syntax with prefixes. And if your uh, favorite editor um, doesn't support this new syntax yet. Data flow was completely re-architected in uh, Angular 2. And uh, now it uh, forces you to use unidirectional data flow. And uh, it actually helps for us developers to better understand what, what happens with our data, how the data flows from uh, one part of our application to another. So we always know that it, it goes from parent component to child component, and only this way. Uh, there are some uh, different possibilities to tweak this uh, flow direction a, a bit, but uh, I recommend you to go for this classic one. When your data uh, properties flow to component to children compo child component through property binding, and uh, ch our child component uh, emits events instead of sending ki kind of data back to our parent component. And uh, as a result, we have really nice understanding on uh, where is the source of our data, and um, it helps Angular to, for example, uh, implement a really nice uh, change detection, really smart and ultra fast. Forms, we all love forms, and Angular 2 gives us um, interesting possibilities to create forms in different ways. So from universe of Angular 1, uh, we could use template-driven ones uh, where we have almost zero code in our component, in, in um, our class. And uh, for sure, this is super simple and uh, 
for example, we have all these uh, validation rules right in our template, but we can't test it. Uh, we, can't, we, we can't unit test it. We have to use end-to-end -end testing to work with our forms. That's why model-driven forms were implemented, and uh, in this case, we have all our controls and all, all our validation logic described right in our controller, in, uh, in our component, in our class, and this is why we, we can unit test it easily. And template, this HTML part, is actually just uh, mm, sim something simple with simple references from uh, our inputs, uh, selects, uh, text areas, whatever custom elements, uh, it, they just refers to our controller. Uh, all the code I will show in next three and a half minutes on the GitHub. I've just taken quick start from Angular, um, removed uh, everything unneeded, uh, and added uh, some components on, to on top of it. Finally, let's have a look at the code. I think I will and mirror. My display. And the code. Yes, so this is guide component uh, you already seen uh, in my slides. Nothing special here. Uh, corresponding template. Again, let's check. Let's just check how it looks. No, no, it was not this. Yes. So you see two-way binding, and some events. So we just did a click, and it changed the color. Next, let's use the next. component, so we have to move it. Hmm, something went wrong. That happens. Of course, I use HTTP for this component, and I have to uncomment import of HTTP providers. Much, much better. So as I described in my slides, this is places component with separate place component uh, within it. Unfortunately, to bad contrast, I have the frames around this. And how the data flows between these two guys. So we have places component. Mm, the template is here. So you, you see we use built-in directive uh, called ng4 and just iterate our places received from HTTP request. And we, put, we pass the name property to the place component, so we see that we use our child component called place, and we receive events back from this component uh, using visit event binding. And place, no, services, place component itself, it looks pretty simple. It's not even, it, it, it doesn't has uh, its own template, it's inline, and on click on this built-in uh, data on this built-in event, I just call some function do visit, 
where I emit the event which later received by its parent component. So the, again, key feature is data flows into child component and events flows out from child component. Mm -mm -mm. What else? I think the last piece of code I want to show because we are already out of time, I'm sorry. How forms look like. And I have feedback form, and this is template-driven one. So you see we have, for example, some validation logic right here, and we use ng-model to bind the, to our model. This is uh, one-way binding. And the code for this form looks it's just zero code, actually. It's uh, just initial data for our form and some logging while we click on it. And the controversial contact form looks super simple. We just specify form control name for it because everything is described right in our component. So here we use uh, the class called form builder, uh, and uh, this is these are two different ways for building our forms. We, this is more wordy one when we create each control explicitly, and we can use form builder to just provide an array of our con our controls. As a result, we have everything right in our JavaScript code, everything con connected to the logic of this form, and we can use reactive approach to this model-driven form, and they even called actually reactive form. Uh, so you have to import something called reactive form directive, because we can think about our form and each component, uh, like about... Uh, data stream and we can subscribe to the, uh, our uh, other components to this stream. Yes, I think this is it from me. I'm sorry for bad timing. If you have any questions, just catch me. I'm here for a while. And Jinku Chi Bardzo.